From Battleborn Progress, this is Out in Front. I'm your host, Jacob Solis. This week, we're taking a look back at 59 years of Medicare and Medicaid, a pair of federal health programs that transformed health care availability for seniors in the American working class. Signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid formed the backbone of the Great Society. In the years since, they've become one of the most recognizable elements of our social safety net, and neither program is perfect, of course, but over the last six decades, they've reshaped the healthcare landscape for tens of millions of Americans. But maybe now more than ever, Medicare and Medicaid are under attack. Conservatives in Congress and in state legislatures across the U.S. have for decades tried to undermine these programs. That's especially true of Medicaid, which is designed to help the poor and the working class. To dig into why these programs are still so important and lay out some of the newest threats, we've got two great guests. Margarita George is the Executive Director for Healthcare for America Now. She joins us to discuss some of the ramifications of Project 2025, the conservative blueprint for a second Trump administration. After that, we welcome former Nevada Lieutenant Governor Kate Marshall, who will break down how Nevada has been affected by Medicare and Medicaid and how state control of those programs could shift how they work. But first, I want to start with my colleague, Anwar Green. You are the one of our organizers here at Battleborn Progress, well, where healthcare is a special focus. Thanks for being here, Anwar. Absolutely, Jacob. Thank you for having me. And just everyone should know that we had a fun recording snafu. So Anwar is being very gracious because the the tech has fought us here. But no one needs to know about that because what we do need to know, Anwar, is Medicare and Medicaid. And frankly, here's what I want to do. I want to set the table for the viewers, for the listeners at home. If you don't know someone who's on Medicare or Medicaid, maybe you don't quite understand exactly how they work because, frankly, these are some of the most complicated federal programs. So if you're going to explain it to someone, right, why should you care about Medicare and Medicaid if you're not on either program? What would you tell them? Ultimately, I would say the reason it's important, the reason you should care um, is because it costs us more money in the long run to provide care to uninsured individuals. It's just like when you get car insurance. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't had a car in a very long time. But when you get car insurance, if you decide to get coverage for uninsured motorists, you pay more if you live in certain parts of certain cities because you're in an area where you're more likely to get hit by somebody who doesn't have insurance. So it costs you and every other insured driver more money. Same thing with health care. Same thing with Medicare and Medicaid. If people don't have insurance, it costs us all more money to provide care for those people. And of course, you have your conservatives who say things like, well, I'm not paying for that and I'm it's not out of my pocket. Yeah, every time it's out of your pocket. So it makes way more sense for us to support something that allows us all to pay less than something that causes everyone to pay more based on some principle that's non-existent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, with that as the framework, I did want to get into a little bit of the history uh, and not the deep history, but the recent history, right? Because, okay, we're at the 59th anniversary here, but one of the big things that happened in you know the last 20 years, right, was the Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act under President Barack Obama. And just, just to sort of lay it out for everyone, what did the Medicaid expansion do? Like, what, what does it actually mean that Congress expanded Medicaid? Uh, the biggest thing about the expansion of Medicaid under the ACA is it stops states from imposing certain restrictions on eligibility, especially stuff like preventing able-bodied adults from enrolling or setting income levels way below the poverty line, not because they really wanted to take care of the less fortunate, but because almost nobody qualified, you know, when the levels were that low. So they didn't want to take care of anybody if they could, if they could help it. So what the ACA uh, and the Medicaid expansion under the ACA did was kind of put a stop to things like that. Um, it was supposed to set the Medicaid enrollment level at 100, 138% of the poverty line in 2014. So about 10 years ago, but thanks to the Supreme Court, no, nah, no, nah, they said no. Nah. And so now we have 
basically a two-tiered system where you've got 40 states that have opted into the expansion and 10 that as of last year still haven't. Um, but for the sake of comparison and not going too long, because again, it's complex and it ain't sexy, but uh, the uninsured rates for adults in the expansion states has fallen twice as fast as those rates for the same people in non-expansion states. So the real question, I don't know, maybe we can get a guest on next episode and they can tell us why certain states like spending more money when they don't have to. Oh, yeah. And for sure, we are going to get into it as we talk to some of our guests today. But first, Anwar, I want to thank you so much for setting that out for everyone. And without further ado, let's get to the rest of the show. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, we are recording. I'm just I'm going to clap for Mindy so that she knows. Okay. And I'm going to turn off my notifications. Okay. Now we want to pivot to some of the national implications of Medicare and Medicaid. And for that, we have the perfect guest. Margarita George is the executive director for Healthcare for America Now, an organization that brings together other national and state grassroots groups to, among other things, fight for affordable quality health care and to protect Medicare and Medicaid. Margarita, thanks for joining me. And me. All right. Well, I guess we'll just get right into it. And uh, just to start broad before we narrow in, um, you know, talking to an expert here, I always love to ask, how can we sort of contextualize Medicare and Medicaid? Because I think it's a thing a lot of people know about, but it's like a bit that like people will say Medicare when they mean Medicaid and vice versa, that they like know these programs exist, but they don't really like have their teeth in it. So how would you contextualize the sort of importance of these programs now that, you know, we're 59 years in, how much do they matter in 2024? They matter more than ever um, for a couple of reasons. So I'll just um, quickly recap. Medicaid and Medicare are the two biggest healthcare programs in the country. Medicaid is a program for people of all ages, and it pays for a lot of things that people don't even realize it pays for. So for instance, Medicaid is the largest payer of birth. Um, you know, in some states, half the babies born are born uh, through Medicaid. They're paid for by Medicaid insurance. It's the it's the largest payer of birth control, right? Contraception. It's the largest payer of long term care for um, elderly people and people with disabilities. So if you have a relative in a nursing home or a relative getting in home care or somebody in hospice, chances are they are um, they are dependent upon Medicaid for uh, paying for those services. It's the largest health care program for children. Um, you know, the children's health care program, the, the children's health insurance program is part of Medicaid. So in some states that insures half the kids in the state. It's the biggest payer of of behavioral health and mental health services and substance abuse services. So it's a huge program. It's jointly funded by the state and the federal government. And in every single state, Medicaid is the number one item in the state budget. And it's a critically important program because it brings money into the state to pay for hospitals, clinics, um, nurses in schools, uh, programs for people with disabilities. It employs tons and tons and tons of people, really important. And then Medicare um, is the program, is the health insurance program for seniors. So once you hit 65, you are eligible to enroll in Medicare. You can enroll in traditional Medicare or you can enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, which is a private insurance plan within Medicare. Um, Medicare is uh, most seniors that you meet will be on Medicare and most people who are long term disability, who are on long-term disability are on Medicare, and it covers everything from hospital stays to preventative care to prescription medicine to, um, you know, procedures that you have in your doctor's office. So a uh, really important program. It's getting bigger and bigger. 66 million people right now enrolled in Medicare. Keep in mind that we are in a point in history where the aging of the population is speeding up. Right now we have 11,000 people turning 65 in the U.S. every single day. So the ranks of Medicare enrollees are really going to grow because we are about to have the largest aging population that we have ever had in the history of the country. And the fastest growing portion of the population right now is the 80 and over crowd. And all of those folks also depend on Medicare. 
Wow. Okay. So with those stakes laid out and stakes they are, I wanted to ask about Project 2025 for the uninitiated. If you haven't heard about it, right, this is the the blueprint for a second Trump administration. We mentioned it earlier in the show and, um, you know, written by ex-Trump staffers and a lot of conservative think tank folks. And frankly, it has a lot of ideas for Medicaid, Uh, not so much about Medicare, but we're going to get to that later. Put a pin in that one. Um, but for now, I wanted to go through some of some of the individual points that they're making, because I wanted to contextualize the fact that, um, frankly, in a lot of conservative states and from a lot of conservative lawmakers, Medicaid in particular, but also Medicare is really under attack and maybe never more so than now. And so mm-hmm. let's let's talk policy. Let's really dig into this, because I think it's one thing to sort of see the bullet points and be like, oh, they're trying to dismantle Medicaid. But like, what does that actually mean? And I think, Margarita, you're the person to ask. So here's a real question instead of me rambling. (laughs) So one thing that comes up a lot is uh, work requirements, right? This is not necessarily a new idea, but it's one that gets thrown around a lot, especially from conservatives. And it's one that I think that maybe like the median voter doesn't react much to sort of, you know, what is theoretically offensive about work requirements, but this is actually really designed to kick people off the program, right? It's, it's restricting who is able to actually use Medicaid. It is. I mean, you know, let me just say about the work requirements thing. It's really a straw man. You know, anybody that works in the Medicaid program or has been around it for a long time knows most people who are getting Medicaid already work over half the people in Medicaid work. The people who don't work are people who have a disability, people who have young kids and they're, you know, taking care of their children. But the vast majority of people in the program work. In fact, the growth in Medicaid has really been from states expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act to cover people who are largely workers in low wage jobs or gig economy jobs. I'm talking about jobs like driving for Uber or DoorDash, or um, you know, working part time, or having a seasonal job in a in a garden center, right? These are people that work, but they are working at jobs that do not offer health care, or they don't have enough hours. They're not working enough hours to qualify for health care, which is you know, anybody who's been in the, the low wage economy knows that's a pretty common thing. Medicaid fills that gap. So for people who are at jobs that don't offer benefits or at at a seasonal job or in the gig economy, and they make a pretty modest amount, even though they're working, those people all qualify for Medicaid. So when the conservatives are talking about, oh my gosh, you know, this is just a giveaway and it's, you know, uh, people taking advantage of the system and they should go out and work. Here's the reality in our country and anybody that's been around or talked to a neighbor or two once in a while understands that The fact that people work in this country is not enough to keep them from A, being poor, B, not being able to afford rent, health care and food at the same time, and C, not having health care because they're working for an employer that doesn't provide health care. So Medicaid is a safety net program that picks up the slack and allows people to have health care, even though they might work, you know, 33 hours instead of the 35 that they need to actually qualify for coverage at their employer. So that's a little bit sort of nutshell on what what the deal is with the work requirements. Right. And those work requirements, it essentially creates an extra bureaucratic barrier that people need to clear, even Absolutely. though they qualify for Medicaid anyways. Absolutely. It's actually the apparatus. It's ironic because the conservatives are always talking about how they're the party of, of small government. But the truth is they are spending millions upon millions upon millions of dollars just wasting money, um, not just... Uh, pushing the whole thing about work requirements, but creating this huge bureaucracy to survey, p- survey people and to force people to document, right? So every month people have to document how many hours they work. Listen, you know, nobody likes red tape in any program. It doesn't matter what it is. And, you know, people can just think through in their own lives examples of this. The more bureaucratic uh, barriers, the more paperwork, the more red tape, the more hoops you have to jump through, the less likely it is that you're going to get the service that you want, because it's just frankly not, people can't deal with the 5,000 steps just to get coverage. And we've just seen that, right? During COVID, we had presumptive eligibility and we streamlined the process to help people enroll in coverage because we just had so many people losing their jobs 
all at once that we needed people to get covered quickly. So we streamlined the program to be able to do that under a COVID, uh, a piece of COVID legislation. That legislation has now expired. The result of that has been that millions upon millions of people have lost their Medicaid coverage, not because their situation has changed, not because they switch jobs or they stop working or anything like that, but just because now the paperwork barriers are so much more than what they used to be that people can't keep up with the constant red tape and they just drop off. So at the end of the day, having more uninsured people, it just costs the rest of us more money, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it is not a smart, efficient or cost effective strategy to have millions upon millions of people who are uninsured. In fact, we everything we know about healthcare reform tells us that when we have millions and millions of uninsured people, and they are counting on the emergency room as their healthcare plan, that tends to raise costs for everybody else because it shifts cost, right? It's called cost shifting. It forces premiums up for everybody else. It's much, much smarter to cover people on the front end through a really efficient program like Medicaid, which is not a, a for-profit private insurance program. It's, it's a government healthcare program. It's the most efficient way to cover people. The administrative costs very, very low, 2% in the program. So we should stop kicking people off of the program and then hoping that somehow, some way, it's gonna save all of us money. That's just, it's never borne out, it's never been true. And the best thing that we could do is use the program to cover people and reduce costs, not only make sure that people have coverage and get preventative care that reduces cost in the system writ large, but it reduces costs for everybody else too. Absolutely. Well, I think digging into this question of eligibility, this is something that Project 25, 2025, I should say, calls out explicitly. They say they want to improve Medicaid eligibility standards. Is it fair to say that when they say improve eligibility standards, they mean restrict eligibility yeah. standards? Yeah. If we're looking at sort of the consistency of the conservative platform here? Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody, I don't think it's news to anybody that, you know, the, the conservative ideology you know, Project 2025 may be new, but these proposals and these concepts around Medicaid and Medicare and healthcare, you know, bigger picture, these are not new things. The Republicans don't believe that the government should provide people with a guaranteed access to quality, affordable health care. They think everybody should just be on their own. And if you get a problem with your insurer, you should just deal with that on your own. And it shouldn't be there shouldn't be any responsibility on the government to make sure that people actually have access to coverage. So it's not at all surprising when, you know, here we are once again on the verge of an election and Republicans have recycled the same old ideas about how they're going to shrink Medicaid down, um, you know, alleging that that somehow saves people money or makes the country better, when in fact, taking health care away from work, low wage working people, taking health care away from people with disabilities, taking health care away from uh, seniors, that doesn't do anything to serve the interests of the country. Saving like that, it, and it doesn't in the long run actually save us any money either. So uh, yes, they have sort of a, a euphemistic, right? It, it seems like they're euphemistically trying to talk about making cuts by saying things like they're going to raise the el eligibility standards or what have you. But really what they mean is they want to make it harder and harder for people to access this health care. Okay. And, and you've mentioned a little bit of this already, but really what the plan is when we talk about Project 2025 and Medicaid is to essentially privatize the whole thing, or at least uh, kick over more of these folks into the private health insurance or healthcare rather industry. Yeah. Um, and I mean, what what is the consequence of that? I guess like when we talk about like they want to privatize Medicaid, what are we talking about? Well, essentially, you know, this is part of the bigger Republican ideology, and that ideology basically is leave it to the market. Right, leave it to the market. We should just let the market control healthcare. So anybody who's listening to this right now, you have your own experience of how that works, right? Listen, we left prescription drugs to the market. We didn't regulate, we don't regulate prescription drugs at all in this country. We don't require negotiations. We let drug companies set their own prices and they set whatever prices the market can bear. And that's how we got. Um, insulin that's $400 a month as opposed to $35 a month. So we already know 
um, we have a good experience and a good sense of what happens when you put the market in charge of healthcare. And I'm not an anti-market person. I think the market is appropriate for some things, for some goods and services. I just don't think healthcare is one of them and that right. it's it should be up to the market to decide. In fact, I'm on the other side of that debate, right? Really what I think is that the primary challenge facing the United States of America right now when it comes to our health care is that we have to figure out a way to reduce profit. We do. I mean, we, we can't have insurance companies, drug companies, medical device manufacturers making gazillions of dollars, really literally more money than many other industries while providing people with lower quality care. So the, the market ideology, the market model that the Republicans are really leaning into when they're proposing privatization. Let's privatize all of these and turn it over to the market and pretend that healthcare are, you know, commodities or let's let's pretend that healthcare is like like we're selling cars here. It just that model does not work for healthcare. And we've seen the negative consequences of that for years. And and the truth is you know, if you are buying an, a new car and you end up buying a lemon, that's bad and, and you get screwed. But if you can't access health care because the market has made the price of your medicine and your treatment so expensive that you can't afford it, now we're, that's a matter of life and death, right? So that is not something that we want to turn over fully to the market. Absolutely. And so there's something that I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that I want to return to, and that is the Medicare of it all, right? So Project yeah. 2025 has very little to say about Medicare, nothing, I think, actually. And so, but that is that is not an omission by accident, right? So what do we actually take from they have all these ideas for Medicaid, but nothing about Medicare? How do we read that? I mean, if I were them, knowing what we know about what they're what they generally have tried in Medicare in the past, which is Jacob, exactly what you mentioned, privatize it, turn it over to Wall Street, make it an entirely private plan. Um, you know, I think they understand this is an election year. Medicare is incredibly popular across the board. Medicare is a program, Medicaid also, programs that Republicans support, Democrats support, older people, younger people. I just saw a poll of 18 to 25 year olds where one of the top three issues in the poll was whether or not Medicare would be around for people when they retire, right? So hugely popular programs. They don't want to say too much because their proposals are very, very unpopular and they know them to be unpopular and they don't want to sort of go on the record saying, yeah, well, we want to turn all the Medicare stuff over to Wall Street during, an, you know, right before an election, because they rightly understand that that would change their chances. Right. It would shift support in the election. So I think that's why they're not saying much about Medicare. But we do know that they have proposals, um, for instance, to make. Medicare Advantage, the default enrollment option in Medicare. And what that means is that when you are 65, if you don't pick a plan, you are automatically enrolled in traditional Medicare, Medicare fee for service. It's the government health care plan. That's right now. What they are saying is rather than automatically enroll you in traditional fee for service Medicare, we'll put you in a Medicare Advantage plan, a private plan a private plan that is really run. These plans are called Medicare Advantage, but they're not Medicare. Most Medicare Advantage plans are owned, operated, and run by the same insurance companies that people who have regular insurance have. So that's Aetna, it's United Healthcare, it's Cigna, right? So um, they're a little, they're, they're sort of undercover about that because that's a frightening prospect to people, right? A lot of people look forward to enrolling in Medicare at 65 because they're frankly tired of dealing with private insurance and they want to get into the big national government health care plan. It's more secure. It's cheaper. You get guaranteed um, coverage. So they don't want to advertise their proposals because I think they're worried about the political consequences. Mm. Yeah, there's certainly, uh, you know, as much as they say, we can take absolutely as much info from what they don't say. Oh, so. Uh, Finally, I wanted to ask about another element of this, and, and this is something else you mentioned, and that's abortion care as a function of Medicaid in particular. And Project 2025, as part of that platform, does mention the sort of the, the ending, uh, they call out Planned Parenthood, but they also say that they want to divert uh, federal funds toward 
uh, they don't say the word, but essentially these crisis pregnancy centers, right? Yeah. Sort of, frankly, often religious institutions that try and counsel women against having abortions um, and carrying those pregnancies to term. So generally speaking, I guess, how how big a function, or I guess, how would you describe sort of abortion care as part of the Medicaid you know, umbrella? Where does it fit in? And what do we mean when we talk about these restrictions that Project 2025 is proposing? Yeah, there are very few states, it's really only a handful of states that cover abortion. And that is because there is a federal law called the Hyde Amendment that prohibits the use of public funding for abortions. So the Hyde Amendment, it's a pretty old amendment at this point, uh, basically says if you want to have an abortion, Medicaid won't cover that except in a few very specific cases where the life of the mother is at risk. Some states have been able to modify their Medicaid programs so that um, abortion is covered, uh, but that's in a very few states. The thing about Medicaid you know, why advocates like myself really think we want to reverse the Hyde Amendment, why actually the Hyde Amendment should be gone and Medicaid should be used to be able to cover abortion is because um, it's used for all other all other sort of reproductive health care. It's used for prevention, right? It's used for birth control. It's used for birth. Um, so there isn't really any logical reason why it can't be used for abortion, except there's a there's a political problem. But interestingly, even while we have this problem, while we're not using a, um, public money to fund abortions, the conservatives are lobbying to divert public money, Medicaid money, um, and other public resources. And you see this in some in some of the state budgets to divert some of that money to crisis pregnancy centers, which I want to be super clear with people are not medical facilities. Crisis pregnancy centers do not provide medical care. There's very rarely any, any medical personnel. When you go to a crisis pregnancy center, the person that is counseling you is not a doctor. Uh, generally, they don't even have nurses on staff. The person that is maybe giving you a, um, a, an ultrasound is a tech right, but not somebody who is really qualified to give you medical advice. So it's really this idea that we would turn over millions and millions of public dollars to CPCs, which exist purely to, di to uh, divert women away from abortion, right? They exist essentially to stop women from having abortions. They provide lots of misinformation. They straight up lie to people and scare people about what could happen if you have an abortion. It's pretty, it's pretty troubling and totally hypocritical, right? We can't, we're not going to provide public money to provide abortions when we know darn well, and all research shows that when you deny people an abortion, that has lifelong consequences, both economic and health consequences for the woman and for any of her existing children. Because keep in mind, most people having abortions already have children. So we know there are very negative health consequences of denying people abortion, but we don't want to use Medicaid money to be able to provide abortions for people who need them. Instead, Republicans want to use Medicaid money to turn over to facilities that are affiliated with churches who don't even have any medical personnel and no medical certification and can't really advise people on anything medical um, to talk them out of having abortions and make them feel like, uh, you know, make them feel guilty so that they won't consider all their options. Pretty troubling. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, those are all the questions I have, but before we go, is there anything else that you want the, the viewers at home to know um, about any of this stuff? I think the, both on, you know, the anniversary of Medicare and Medicaid, but also, frankly, these threats that are cropping up now? Yeah, I would say this, especially because we're on the eve, you know, of an election. And, um, you know, I'm a huge fan and have worked on Medicaid and Medicare for many, many years at this point. And uh, they're great programs. There's a lot to do to improve them, right? So there's lots of things that we could do to go further in Medicaid to provide services. We certainly need to expand it for substance abuse and behavioral health and mental health issues. I mean, we have a literally a, a mental health crisis in our country right now and just not enough resources to support the type of services that people really need, particularly in rural states. We have an aging population 
there's so many people aging into elderhood right now. They call it the silver tsunami. That is what it's being called. So Medicaid is the long-term care payer. It needs more investment for sure. And same, same on the Medicare front. I would just say to people, if you're thinking about these programs and what we would like to see, we would like to have a more robust Medicaid and Medicare. We would like to have a Medicare that covers dental, vision, and hearing for people. We'd like to have all drug prices negotiated in Medicare. We would like Medicare to stop overpaying billions of dollars to private insurance companies. So there's lots of good things that we could do in these programs to strengthen them for the future and ensure that you know every generation to come is going to have access to them. Next year, there's going to be a huge fight where a lot of conservatives are going to say, uh, we need to do something to rein in these programs. They're going to collapse the federal budget. And they're going to be saying that at the same time that they're engaged in a debate about how to extend the Trump tax cuts. So anytime you hear any politician of any stripe talking about how we need to extend the Trump tax cuts, which is really tax cuts for people making over 400000 a year, uh, that should raise a flag for you, because if we can afford to give rich people making over four hundred thousand dollars a year yet another tax break, then there's no reason we ought to be talking about cutting Medicaid or Medicare. My goodness, we ought to be talking about investing in those programs, expanding them, making them more robust so that people's health care needs really can be met um, in, in the future. So I would just say that, you know, it's sometimes hard to follow these national debates and um you know, as we see in the Project 2025 document, they're pretty good at wordsmithing to make it seem like, oh, this seems like a, such a good idea. But really pay attention because um, we should be really suspicious. These programs together, Medicaid and Medicare together, ensure well over half the population, 150 million people. When they're talking about making massive changes and cuts, that is going to affect you, somebody you know, somebody in your family, one of your neighbors. And, uh, you know, they're not going to tell you the, the full truth. They're not going to tell you that they want to make those cuts and they want to take that health care away from people at the same time that they want to give more tax breaks to the richest people in your state. Absolutely. Well, lots of chew on there, but we're going to have to leave it there for now. Margarita George is the Executive Director of Healthcare for America Now. Margarita, thanks so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And now that we have a sense of the national landscape, we wanted to zoom into Nevada to get a sense of the landscape here. To do that, we brought in the former Nevada Lieutenant Governor and the former White House Advisor to Governors, Kate Marshall. Kate, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Appreciate you asking me to be on your program. Absolutely, absolutely. So like I said, focusing in in Nevada, we talked a little earlier in the show about so much of Medicaid funding in particular is a state issue, right? It is often, or I think always, we'll say often, the number one budget item for a lot of states. And so when we're talking about such a huge budgetary impact, I guess, how can you contextualize the way that states interact with Medicaid? And I guess through this Nevada lens, right? What is the way that Nevada interacts with Medicaid? So um, when you talk about the, uh, Nevada's budget, there are really three major buckets that eat up all the money. Um, one is um, Medicaid, um, social services, uh, health, so health and human services. One is education and one is prisons. Arguably, if you would <clears throat> increase your funding for health and human services and education, you could decrease your funding for prisons. Uh, so that's the first thing I think people should focus on. The second thing is that um, you actually get improved outcomes in education if you have healthy people. And we actually have um, only about 15% uh, of Medicaid enrollees in Nevada are elderly. Uh, the rest are adults and children. And um, even though they use less money, you know, by, you know, per capita, um, there's a, we have a lot of children enrolled in Medicaid. Um, I, I want to bring it to children because I think that if you can improve the health outcomes of children, you can improve their education outcomes, and then you can improve the economy of our state going forward because we have healthier, more able people. 
what one of the things that Nevada could do that it doesn't do, but um, I think maybe 22, 23 states do this, is they can increase the amount of federal money that can come in to match state funding for Medicaid recipients by using CHIP. So CHIP is the Child's Healthcare Insurance Plan. <clears throat> Under CHIP, we could actually provide prenatal care to women. This has been something that the federal government passed in 2001. Uh, and like I said, many states have adopted it. Nevada has not. And what it does is it would increase the amount of federal funding from the 61% match you have under Medicaid to 72% match you have under CHIP. So you could uh, provide more federal funding and thus reduce the state's burden to provide prenatal care. Hmm. Well, reason- I want to dig into that a little bit before before we move off that, because uh, just to contextualize this even a little further, right, when we talk about, the, okay, the states have to fund or have to, the states are funding these such large portions of Medicaid. Um, state budgets are frequently a choice, right? It's a it's affirmative decision that state lawmakers are making, Always. right? That governors are making, right? And you so put your money where your interests are. <laughs> right. So yeah. So when when states are making these choices, you're what you're saying here is that there are choices that Nevada could make that just sort of historically haven't been made. Yeah. Well, part it's not. It it sounds really simple, right? It sounds look. So we just use chip funding. And then we get a higher federal match. But it's not quite that simple because let's say that you can get more women and children uh, into prenatal care. The problem with that is that you then need the structure to Mm. support that. So you need the doctors. And there is an opportunity, if you think about it, um, uh, you know, every crisis has an opportunity. Um, there's mm-hmm. an opportunity that because of the restrictions on reproductive services in other states, there are doctors in other states that would like to come to Nevada. Um, mm-hmm. They don't want to be pro- providing reproductive care in their state because there's all these questions about what they can do and what they can't do. And you basically have politicians and lawyers determining what healthcare services should be. So they would like to come to Nevada, which leaves healthcare services up to doctors and patients where it should be. But we need to be able to say, look, if you come here, we have these reimbursement rates that would make it so that you could actually have a business here. So it's not it's not as black and white. There's a number of things that we would need to do in conjunction together to build the infrastructure so that we could get the doctors, so that we could get people care, and so that we could get us more federal dollars. Gotcha. And, and the reason I bring that up, that's a really important point, because mm-hmm. during COVID, there was a lot of federal money flowing to states. But you found that Nevada, in particular, did not have the infrastructure to absorb that money and then to push it out into programs. Mm. And so while we might talk about funding, we have to build the infrastructure for healthcare, for childcare, for education, for these things, so that we can absorb federal funds. Right now, we turn federal funds away routinely, mm-hmm. routinely. Nevada will say no to federal dollars because they don't have the infrastructure. So, mm. so we we need to build the infrastructure, and that requires investment. So now go back to your original comment. Oh, we, you know, budget is about where your priorities are, right? Mm-hmm. So if your priorities are, which politicians say this all the time, oh, my priorities are in the people, right? Families, right. working people. If that's really really where your priorities are, then you need to invest in the infrastructure to support that. You need to invest in your health care system. You need to invest in your child care system. You need to invest in your education system and stop investing in your prison system. Right. I Which guess to this point, it, it is. <laughs> if you invest in these other systems, mm-hmm. you can then re- you won't need as much money for your prison system, if that makes sense. 
Absolutely, right? All these problems are, are interconnected with each other, right? And and like you say, yes. the sort of the lack of spending on infrastructure begets the lack of, uh, we'll call it uh, grants or just federal money, right? Federal money is left on the table, like you say, because that infrastructure isn't there. And I guess this this dovetails into what I also wanted to ask about, because you had a front row seat in the least fun way, probably, when COVID happened in the middle of state government. Um, and obviously a big part of, you know, when the ship, the strip shut down, there was the budget crisis that ensued and all this federal money comes in, but there are delays and things can't happen immediately. And it's an extremely, extraordinarily complicated process through everything that happened in the intervening two years after that, I guess, what were the lessons that you took away from that process? I, I think in particular, when it comes to Medicaid, um, and healthcare in particular, what do you think the state should have taken from that? And I guess, do you think that leaders here maybe are, are more or less equipped now to think about how to improve these systems? I guess, what do you think is the consequence of all this? Big, big question, but uh, you know, like, do, are, did we come out of this in a better place? Um, certainly Nevada had, um, incre uh, decreases in child poverty because of all the money spent, um, for children. And anytime you have a decrease in child poverty, that is a, a huge plus for the state, for families, for everyone. Um, so after COVID, when um, Congress decided not to extend the child tax credit, uh, that's unfortunate because we have seen our child poverty go up again. The other thing that the that the federal government did is they were paying um, free and reduced lunch um, around the uh, uh, all all year, not just during mm -hmm. the school year. And our and uh, our current governor um, declined to accept money that the feds offered to continue that program in the summer. That I think, um, in my view, is an error. Um, mm -hmm. you, you want to keep your children as healthy as possible. And part of children being healthy is that they can eat and that mm. they're not hungry. Um, so I put these systems, our healthcare system and our education system together, because I think when you don't invest in those systems, then you have to invest in these other things that I talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so Part of what I saw, especially when I went to the White House, was that those states that had invested in the infrastructure, in their healthcare infrastructure, in their childcare infrastructure, in their education infrastructure, were able to take and make much more of the federal dollars that came in. And they were really able to expand and do things they hadn't been able to do before. And was Nevada was caught in its back foot. So mm -hmm. what that tells me is that I think you have legislators now who have seen that. And so what that tells me is that we must begin the process of investing in these structures. And that uh, likely means that we need to increase reimbursement rates mm -hmm. to attract doctors, uh, to make sure that those services are available. Uh, I also want to caution you, a lot of times people think of this and they think, well, you know, this is just for inner city Vegas. And mm -hmm. that is so not true. Uh, we have a huge problem in rural Nevada with access and care. Mm -hmm. And we have we have problems in uh, inner city, in suburban areas, everywhere. Uh, Nevada, it, it, don't think that in your neighborhood, there isn't someone that doesn't need services. Mm. Uh, mental health services, health care services, education services. Uh, it is just that widespread in Nevada. So we shouldn't think of it as, oh, well, that's for people that are not like me, because that's not true. Uh, it's for quite a, a significant number of Nevadans. Right now, today, we have about 21% um, of, of Nevadans are covered by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. But we have about 32% of our population are low income. And so we also have a, a problem with people who are eligible and who are not covered. Um, mm. So it, 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 it's a much more widespread. When I say 32%, that means if there are three people standing in the room, one of them is eligible. Right. 
Right. But so, right, you say, you know, 21% are, are actually on Medicaid, right? If five people are in a room, only one of them is actually on the service. So yes. I guess looking at this and thinking about the way all these problems are cascading, right? In the way that, um, you know, say there's a physician, I mean, not say there is a physician shortage, right? And there's been one for a long time. It's not a new problem for, for policymakers. But like you say, reimbursement rates are an issue. There's so many of these interconnected issues that, you know, all need solutions, I guess, to, to what extent, and I guess let's zero in on reimbursement rates. Why are reimbursement rates um, such an intractable thing? I guess to, if it's a, if it's a problem that can be clearly identified, right, what is the sort of uh, impediment to getting changes that would, you know, get more doctors to move to Nevada, like you say, in this, this current environment? It's a big number. So mm -hmm. um, first off, you, you said all, all these, you know, uh, 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 challenges um, and difficult things. But I, I want you to think about it in terms of all these opportunities to improve the lives of people that live in Nevada, mm -hmm. right? It, it It's not a bad thing to improve people's lives. It's a good thing to have that opportunity to do that. And the Absolutely. fact that we are in a place where we could do that if we wanted to is a great thing because what we can do is we can say, listen, if you're a, a person here and you live in Nevada, I can improve your life, mm -hmm. right? The legislature can say that I can actually make your life better. So think of it as an opportunity. But the, the first hurdle is that's a big number. Remember mm -hmm. I told you in the beginning, I said, well, if you look at the state's budget, it's education, uh, health and human services and prisons, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to tell you I want to increase uh, reimbursement rates, that's going to be a big number. And every time you see a big number, then people balk. Right. Now, they they want to in, in Nevada. We we, <laughs> we very much want to do things without having to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that that's uh, uh, I guess it's a political um, way that people are, but it, it is not the way to actually get things done. You you actually have to put your money where your mouth is. If you care mm -hmm. about people's health in this state. And you have to put some money there. And that then creates the opportunities. If I put money into reimbursement rates, then those doctors that are in those states like Texas, where they don't want to be, then they mm -hmm. can come here. Then they can come here. Now I can provide those services. Now I can expand the services, collect more federal dollars, provide the services, right? But it all starts with whether I'm willing to make that initial investment. So you got to take that first step. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. But Kate Marshall, you're the former lieutenant governor of Nevada and the former, uh, oh, no, I lost my <laughs> the, the advisor oh, to yes, the governors for oh, yes, the White yes. House. Um, Kate, thanks so much for taking the time today. Uh, thank you very much. And just remember, you know, the people in Nevada are worth it. Absolutely. Worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.